Hello everyone and welcome to the YouTube Live yet again eMath Instruction Algebra 2 Review Session for the Regents exam that's going to happen tomorrow morning. My name is Kirk Weiler, I represent eMath Instruction and tonight we're going to be going through an entire Algebra 2 Regents exam from the first problem to the last problem. We're going to be doing the June 2019 Algebra 2 Regents exam from New York State. If you don't already have a copy of that, you can go over to emathinstruction.com, you can go to our blog section, click on the eMath May 2022 newsletter, scroll by all of the boring stuff that you don't really want to read, get down to the point where we talk about which Regents exams we're going to be doing, and download a copy of this exam. You can always pause this video at any time because even though we are streaming live, we're also automatically uploading to YouTube as well. So you can pause, you can come back to it, etc. We're also streaming live on the eMath Instruction Instagram channel, but the YouTube is going to be the better experience in terms of really going through the exam because we're going to be going to the board, coming back to me, doing things like that, etc. Let's get at it. So I'm going to get right into the exam. I seem to have already lost my pen and I'm not even on page one. That's, that's how discombobulated we already are because this is the second time we're trying this tonight. For some reason our streaming software just bailed on our first attempt. But I think it's working now. Is it working now, Joey? Yes, it is. All right. So we've got the June 2019 Algebra 2 exam. Let's get right to it with the multiple choice questions. And let's start with question, oh, excellent. Right away I get the zooming issues. Let's fit that page. All right, let's take a look at question number one. A sociologist reviews randomly selected surveillance video from a public park over a period of several years and records the amount of time people spent on a smartphone. The statistical procedure the sociologist used is called which of the following? A census, an experiment, an observational study, or a sample survey? Wow, I thought this was a test in Algebra 2 and we're going to start off with a statistics question and not just a statistics question but like a statistics methodology question. Well at the end of the day this thing is an observational study but really quickly let me talk about the other ones, right? A census is when you literally go out and you ask an entire group of people a particular question and you're getting an answer from it. Of course the most famous census is the population census that happens every 10 or 20 years, I always forget. And experiment on the other hand that's when you have treatment groups right you know you've got a control maybe a set of plants here that you just you know give water to another set of plants here that you give water and fertilizer to right that's an experiment a sample survey is when you have let's say a group of people that you're interested in and you simply take a sample survey of their answers to a particular question let's say you want to try to get a feeling for you know how popular a particular politician is so you randomly call 50 people and you you know ask them you know what their 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 preferences. An observational study is literally, and this is a great example of one, where you sit back as an observer and you just basically observe and take data from those observations. Like let's say that you sat in a park and you just watched people go by and you recorded what color of shirt they were wearing, right? That would be an observational study. You know, you're not kind of like, you know, uh, sp picking a specific question, calling people and surveying them like you would do in a sample survey. There's no experience experiment going on and there's no census either. Okay, whatever. Let's go on to something that actually has to do with Algebra 2. Question number two. Which statements are true for all real numbers? Statement one, x minus y quantity squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. Number two, x plus y quantity cubed is equal to x cubed plus 3xy plus y cubed. All right, now these types of equations, when we're talking about things that are true for all real numbers, those are what we call identities. And there are tons and tons of identities, in fact an infinite number of identities in mathematics, where sort of the left hand side and the right hand side are always equal to each other no matter what numbers you plug in. Now in theory we could figure this out by literally taking the left side of both of these two expressions and expanding it. In other words doing x minus y times x minus y expanding that and seeing if it's equal to this. And likewise here, this would take more time, x plus y cubed, we'd have to do x plus y times x plus y times x plus y and see if it's equal to this. But remember, if this is true for all real numbers, then I should be able to pick any two values of x and y, plug them into the left side, plug them into the right side, and it should make the two equal. 
for both of them. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna experiment a little bit here and I'm gonna use x equals one and I'm gonna use y equals one, all right? There's nothing, that, I just can't get rid of that red line. Um, it just, no matter what, it wants to think it's red. Okay, there we go. So I'm gonna use x equals one and y equals one. Now if I take the first particular equation and I substitute those in, I get one minus one squared is equal to one squared plus one squared. I get zero squared is equal to one plus one and zero is equal to two. Well, that's not true. And remember, I'm looking for something that's true for all real numbers and that didn't work. Now I'm gonna, so right away, anything involving one is out. So choice one is out, choice two is out. Right now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the same thing with x equals one and y equals one, but I'm gonna try it in choice two. I'll do it down here where I have one plus one quantity cubed equals one cubed plus three times one times one plus one cubed. Sorry, I gotta bring this down here. One plus one is obviously two, so that's two cubed. Over here, one cubed is one. Three times one times one is three. And one cubed again is one. Two to the third is eight. One plus three plus one is equal to five. And that's again a big fat no, right? And so it's also not this one, which means it's neither one nor two. Neither one nor two. Now. Again, had I found out that either one of these did check with x equals one and y equals one, that wouldn't necessarily mean that it was true for all real numbers. It could have just been true for that, that pair. But this pair shows that neither one of these is true for all real numbers. And so it's choice four. Wow, what a mess of things I've made. But let's take a look at the first problem that we're gonna use our graphing calculator technology on. Problem number three. What is the solution set to the following system of equations? Well, I could certainly solve this system of equations algebraically by substituting 3x plus 6 down here for y, expanding this out, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? But, of course, the solution to a system of equations is representing the intersection point or points of those two equations. So let's just put this into our Texas Instruments calculator. I'm gonna be using the TI Inspire CX calculator tonight. All right, so I'm going to add a graph. Okay, let me just grab my, my cheat sheet here. All right, so I need to put in 3x plus six. That's one of my functions. My other function is x plus four squared minus 10. All right, and then I kick back and I take a look at what I've got. Now remember, I'm trying to solve this system. Let me maximize this. And I've got a parabola and a line. Now I should have known that right away by just looking at the two functions. Looks like they intersect somewhere up here and somewhere down here off the screen. So my, my window isn't good enough for me to see what's going on. I'm gonna go into menu, into window, and I'm actually gonna do what's called a zoom out. All right, and I'm just gonna click right here. I'm gonna hit escape. And now what happens is I can see my two intersection points, right? One of them's here, one of them's here. Now, if I really kind of noted those two, I probably could go back and figure out what the correct answer is. But let's take this as a chance to look at the intersect option on my calculator. It's a great option, right? If I hit menu and I go to analyze graph and then I choose intersection, now, the first thing it's gonna ask me is for my lower down bound. I just wanna put my line somewhere to the left of where the, the intersection point is. I'm gonna hit enter. Then I'm gonna move it past and hit enter. And there's my first intersection point, negative five, negative nine, okay? Now, I'm gonna find my other intersection point, which I can kind of tell just by looking at the graph, but let's use that intersect command one more time, okay? So now again, I need my lower bound, which means I need to move my line to the left of the intersection point. I hit enter. I move my vertical line to the right. I hit enter. There's my intersection point again, zero, six. So I have them, right? My intersection points are negative five, negative nine, and zero, six. Easy peasy. Choice three. All right. One could certainly also do this problem by putting them into your calculator and looking at a table of values, right? And kind of seeing how that works out. But boy, those intersection commands are great on the calculator. Let's take a look at problem number four. Irma initially ran one mile in over 10 minutes. She then began a training program to reduce her one mile time. 
She recorded her one mile time once a week for 12 consecutive weeks as modeled in the graph below. Which statement, let me get this kind of up there. Which statement regarding Irma's one mile training program is correct? All right, look, let's, let's boil this down. This, this is mathematical, but this is really a physics problem, okay? Because the first two options, one, her one mile, time, her one mile speed increased as the number of weeks increased, and two, her one mile speed decreased as the number of weeks increased. Well, that's all about speed, right? And so what you're supposed to know in this problem is that speed is equal to distance divided by time. Now, in this particular example, the distance is a constant one mile, right? So what we're talking about is speed being one mile divided by time, okay? You know, and of course that would be like miles per minute or something like that. Now, what should be obvious no matter what is if you're running a fixed distance and your time for that distance decreases, then your speed must increase, right? So as time goes down, right? As the amount of time it takes me to run a mile goes down, my speed increases, right? Now, by the way, if you kind of just think about this problem, the two, first two options are sort of diametric opposites. One of them is speed increased, one of them was speed decreased. The only way that this wouldn't have been one of these two is if the answer had been the speed was constant throughout the number of weeks she trained. But the speed was certainly not constant because her time went down, her speed went up. So her speed increased as the number of weeks increased. As simple as that. We don't even need to look at three and four. They're silly. Let's move on. Number five. This is an excellent Algebra 2 problem. A seven-year lease for an office space states that the annual rent is $85,000 for the first year and will increase by 6% each additional year of the lease. What is the total rent expense for the entire seven-year lease? All right. Well, let's just start to write it out, right? For the first year of the lease, it's 85,000. Now, for the second year, that is going to increase by 6%, which means the amount for our second year is going to be 85,000 times 1.06. Now, for the third year, right, this is going to be this number times another 1.06, or better yet, 85,000 times 1.06 squared. All right, now notice something, right? This is year one, this is year two, maybe be consistent, Kirk, year two, this is year three, right? And we're gonna have seven years. So what will be my last term? That will be 85,000 times 1.06, not to the seventh, but to the sixth, right? We're gonna have six increases. Now, one way to figure out what this sums up to is to just take your calculator out. There's only seven terms. I did it myself, it took me about 30 seconds to type in 85,000 plus 85,000 times 1.06 plus 85,000 times 1.06 squared plus 85,000 times 1.06 to the third, to the fourth, to the fifth, to the sixth, enter, right? But what they really want you to do on this problem is use what's called the geometric series formula. This is what's called the geometric series because each one of these terms is a part of a geometric sequence, all right? Let's take a look at the geometric series formula way down here on our formula sheet. This will be one of the few times we go to the formula sheet. I just thought I'd make you ill by making it flicker like that. So right about here, we've got our geometric series, okay? And this tells us what the sum of a geometric series is if we know the number of terms, that's n. We know the first term in our particular series, that was 85,000. We know the common ratio, that's called r. Let me like zoom in a little bit on this. I think it's, I think it's okay to zoom in now. I don't think it's too dangerous. Um, 
Uh, so we've got R, which is the common ratio. That's what you're multiplying by each time. That's 1.06. And we've got the R down here again, 1.06. The big difference is the R in the numerator is being raised to the number of terms, which in our case is equal to seven, not six, right? The number of terms is actually how many things you're adding, okay? So let me go back to our problem. Let's plug it all in. Come on, get back to it. Almost. Yeah, here we go. Okay, I'm gonna actually do it right up here. The sum of those seven terms is going to be 85,000 minus 85,000 times 1.06 to the seventh, all divided by one minus 1.06. And that's just number crunching, but let's go over to our calculator just to make sure that we can do it. Um, let me real quickly. Uh, insert a calculator. Let's go to our fraction bar. We had 85,000. That just didn't work at all. Um, let's try that again. 85, slow down a little bit, 85,000 minus 85,000 times 1.06 raised to the seventh, because we have seven terms. Get down there in the denominator. 1 minus 1.06. That all looks good, I think. Yep. And we get 713,476.20 dollars. Now again, it doesn't take that much. You don't have to use this formula. You can just do the 85,000 plus 85,000 times 1.06 plus eight. And if you're really smart about it, you would factor an 85,000 out of all of that and just do 85,000 times the quantity one plus 1.06 plus 1.06 squared plus 1.06 to the third, et cetera. But they kind of want you to use this formula. That's sort of like the quote fastest way to get there. And our answer ends up being choice four. All right, let's keep going. Classic geometric series problem. Okay, problem number six. The graph of y equals f of x is shown below. Um, let me just point out that this graph has the points 2 comma 10, 4 comma 20, 6 comma 40, and they ask which expression defines f of x. All right, look, look, there is no way you should get this problem wrong. No way you should get this problem wrong. Now we'll talk about how you should be able to look at the graph and figure out what the answer is based on these three points. But, but the plain fact is, right, you've got four formulas you should be able to take x equals two, plug it into each one of these four formulas and see if it gives you y equals 10. If it doesn't, it's the wrong formula. So I'm gonna do that really quickly. Again, I'm just gonna check to see if this point lies on any one of these you know, four choices. And now I'm gonna erase all those arrows. So if I put two in this one, right, that's just two times two, that's equal to four. That one is definitely wrong. If I put two in this one, I get five times two squared, which is five times four, which is 20. And again, not that one. If I put two in here, I get five times two to the two divided by two, which is five times two to the first, which is 10. Ooh, that one looks good. That one's a possibility, but let me do the last one really quick. That's five times two to the two times two. That's equal to five times two to the fourth. That's equal to five times 16, which is equal to 80, and that one's wrong as well. So it's choice three, right? I don't even have to know about these other two points because the only one that actually goes through the point two comma 10 is choice three. Now let's talk for a minute about what they're really getting at in this problem before you know, we move on. You know, again, there's just no reason you should miss a problem like that because you can do that checking. But here's the real idea, right? The real idea is that, you know, we can kind of tell that we have a y-intercept here of five, right? And that we've got an exponential function going on, right? This is classic exponential. After having exponentials in both algebra one and algebra two, you should feel very comfortable with that. Now, obviously what we also see is that we see an output here of 10, an output here of 20, and an output here of 40. Therefore, we're having a doubling of the y values, but it's happening every two units in x. Every two units in x, we're doubling. And so this is kind of like a classic, what's called doubling problem, where you always have some initial value, which is five, times two raised to x divided by what I would call the doubling time, 
all right? So if the doubling time had been five units of x, it would have been, had been 25 units of x, it would have been x divided by 25. The doubling unit here is two units of x, so it's simply five to the two divided time, two raised to the x divided by two. All right, we're gonna see a very similar phenomenon later on in a, a free response problem when we're not doubling something, but when we're having something, when we're cutting something in half. All right, let's keep going. All right, seven is a very, very critical problem, so let's take a look at it. Given p of x is equal to x cubed minus three x squared minus two x plus four, which statement is true? Okay, great. So it says x minus one is a factor because p of negative one is equal to two. Okay, x plus one is, equal, is a factor because p of negative one is equal to two. x plus one is a factor because p of one is zero and x minus one is a factor because p one is zero. Okay, so this is critical, all right? There is a connection between the zeros of a polynomial, the x values that make the output equal to zero, and its factors, okay? So the connection between zeros and factors. Now, by the way, because it's a connection between zeros and factors, and zeros are the values of a, of a function that make it equal to zero, I'll use p for the function here, so they're the values of the functions that make the output zero, right? So the, the, these two, choice one and choice two, no, that doesn't have anything to do with it, right? If the output isn't zero, then we can't talk about factors, okay? But once we have an output of zero, then what happens is if p of a is equal to zero, then x minus a is a factor, all right? So for instance, if I know that p of negative, a uh, p of three is equal to zero, x minus three is a factor. If I knew that p of negative two is equal to zero, x plus two is equal to a, is equal a factor, right? And this, this all comes down to the zero product law, right? And the idea that if we were trying to solve for the zeros of that polynomial, we were trying to find them, we would factor this thing into all of these binomial factors and then we'd set each binomial factor equal to zero and we'd kind of get the opposite value of x, right? If x minus three is equal to zero, then x is equal to three. If x plus two is equal to zero, then x is equal to negative two. So at the end of the day, the correct answer here is x minus one is a factor because one, x equals one, is a zero. All right, absolutely critical. We're gonna see that connection come up again and again and again in this test. Whether it's solving an equation that we have to set equal to zero or constructing the equation of a polynomial graph given its zeros, we're gonna keep seeing this connection come up. All right, let's talk about some exponent laws. Let me fit width really quick. Um, I'm gonna erase this. All right, number eight. For x greater than or equal to zero, which equation is false, all right? I don't love the way they put this. They really should say for x is greater than or equal to zero, which equation is not always true? That's different, right? Because equations can be false, you know, for particular values of x, right? Or they could say which equation isn't an identity, but quite frankly, this is actually a poorly written question. Anyway, that being said, the idea is if I work out both sides of these two uh, expressions, however I want to look at them, you know, are they the same thing? Now, one of the unfortunate things is the one that's wrong is choice one, and we'll take a look at that in a moment. But let me just for a minute take a look at one that is correct, which is true, I guess, um, you know, just so that you can kind of see it, right? So let's take a look at this one just for a minute where we have um, x to the three halves to the one half and the fourth root of x cubed. Forgetting about the right hand side for a second, if I have x to the three halves raised to the one half, what my exponent laws tell me is that I should multiply those two exponents together. So x to the three halves to the one half is x to the three halves times one half, which is equal to x to the three fourths. All right, now if we look at the other side of that expression, we've got the fourth root of x cubed, which is x to the third raised to the one fourth. And if I multiply, whoops, if I multiply three times one fourth, 
I get, again, x to the 3 fourths. So in other words, those two are always equal to each other. It's always true. Again, this equation, which is the correct answer, right, that one actually is true when x is equal to zero. All right, so it, it's not always false, but that's not the point. All right, the point is, if we take a look at number one, and we look at the left-hand side, which is x is three half, x to the three halves squared, well then I have to multiply those two exponents. And when I do, the twos cancel, and I'm just left with the left-hand side being x to the third. Right, so that's your left-hand side. Your right-hand side, which is the fourth root of x cubed, is clearly not equal to x cubed. It's x to the three-fourths again, and those two are not generally equal. Not generally equal. All right, I, I, I hesitate to say that's false, all right, because x to the third equals x to the three-fourths for x equals zero. They're also equal when x is equal to one. You know, so there are values of x that make these two, that make that equation true, but whatever. The, the point is, you know, which one of these things is not always true, and that's, that's choice one. They just kind of messed up on their wording. We all do it, we all make mistakes. All right, I'm gonna just take a brief moment. We're just a little bit past 6.30. We got a little bit of a late start, but we're about a half an hour in. And it's time for Weiler's first Lemonade break. Lemonade, the color of the green screen, and therefore it can just mysteriously disappear. I guess it doesn't. Can you expose the antenna, please? Can I expose the antenna? That that sounds questionable, Joey. Um, I will I will try to expose the antenna. Um, hopefully, it will not fall off my shorts. All right. That sounded bad too. All right, let's, um, this is the third one of these I've been doing. <laughs> let's, let's get back to our multiple choice questions. Ooh. Number nine, what is the inverse of the function y equals 4x plus five? All right, great. This is about as like lock standard as you get. Look, if you're asked for the inverse of a particular function, it's a two-step process. Step one, reverse x and y. Step two, solve for y. So step one, reverse x and y. x equals 4y plus five. That's step one. Step two, solve for y. I'm gonna do that by subtracting five from both sides. My second step is going to be dividing everything by four. Please watch out for that, right? That cancels and I get y equals one fourth x minus five fourths. And that's choice two. Man, you gotta like a question that's just as straightforward as straightforward gets. You know, the one thing I think that could probably get people is choice one where it says x equals one fourth y minus five fourths, but again, that's not the way it works. That's actually, believe it or not, the same equation as this one. Um, it's just rewritten in a different way. Oh my, did it again. Let's take a look at question number 10. Which situation could be modeled using a geometric sequence? Well, it's interesting that this particular problem comes after that one with the 85,000 because that was an example of a geometric series. And the difference between a series and a sequence is a sequence is kind of a list of numbers and a series is adding all those numbers up, right? Now, a geometric sequence is a sequence of numbers where you go from one number to the next number by multiplying by the same amount each time. Not adding, that would be uh, what's called an arithmetic sequence. I almost said an additive sequence. An arithmetic, arithmetic sequence. Um, uh, this, we're talking about a geometric sequence where we multiply to get to the next value each time. So let's take a look at our four choices. Choice number one, a cell phone company charges $30 per month for two gigabytes of data and $12.50 for each additional, additional gigabyte of data. Nope, this one's gonna be arithmetic because you're gonna be adding 1250 on each time to get to the next price, if you will. Number two, the temperature in your car is 79 degrees. You lower the temperature of your air conditioning by two degrees every three minutes in order to find a comfortable temperature. Again, this is arithmetic because you're gonna be going from 79 to 77 to 75 to 73, right? You're changing by the same interval each time. Let's take a look at number three. 
David's parents have set a limit of 50 minutes per week that he may play online games during the school year. However, they will increase his time by 5% per week for the next 10 weeks just to irritate him with a bunch of math. Um, so in this case, he's going to have 50 minutes per week. He's going to get, you know, he's going to get to increase it to 50 times 1.05, then 50 times 1.05 times 1.05, then 50 times 1.05 times 1.05 times 1.05. There's our winner, right? He's going to get to increase it each time by multiplying by 1.05. Right, so that's our geometric sequence, and actually quite similar to our problem with the 85,000. In that case, I think it was a 6% increase each year where we were multiplying by 1.06. Okay, problem number 11. The completely factored form of n to the fourth minus 9n squared plus 4n cubed minus 36n minus 12n squared plus 108 is which of the following? All right, so now I love this problem. I'm just gonna say it right up front. I love this problem, but that's because I'm a math geek, okay? And I, I, I like to factor more than I probably should. All right, so now, you know, you got these like basically three general techniques of factoring, right? There's common factors, factoring common factors out of things, right? Most of the time, greatest common factors, but common factors, right? Then you've got your difference of perfect squares. That's like factoring like x squared minus 25 into x plus five, x minus five. And then you got trinomial factoring. That's like factoring, you know, like x squared uh, minus two x minus eight into x minus four times x plus two, right? This crazy thing has to incorporate some of those techniques. But what they're really looking for you to do is kind of look at it and sort of see some structure going on. And when I first thought about this, the first thing I thought about was maybe grouping it into three, into two different trinomials and trying something there. You know, maybe factoring a GCF out of this and a GCF out of that. And there might still be some worth to that, but I kind of got scared off by that because I went from an n to the fourth to an n squared back up to an n cubed. And I just, I felt like if I factored an n squared out of here, what was that going to get me? n squared, n, you know, just a negative 9 and then an n to the first. So then I realized if I just looked at these two terms, let's just look at this just for a second, right? I could take these two terms and I could factor an n squared out. And when I did that, I would get n squared minus 9. Right, just those first two terms. So I'd get n squared times n squared minus nine, and I know n squared minus nine, that factors into n plus three times n minus three. Okay, right? And look at all those n plus three times n minus three. n minus three times n minus three, that's not so much. n plus three times n minus three. I, I like this, right? So then that made me think, well, instead of grouping it in three and three, let me see what happens if I do GCF on the first two, on the second two, and on the third two. So in other words, what I'm going to do is I'm really going to look at this. I'm going to use the associative property of addition. Yeah, that's right. I went there to group this in the following way. Right? So I'm going to group each one of those two kind of binomials together. The associative property of addition allows me to do that. And I'm going to do a GCF on each one of these. Now on this one, we already talked about, I'm sorry, that's an n to the fourth, not an n squared. Now on this first one, we already talked about it. I can factor an n squared out and I get n squared minus 9. Now on the second two, right, I can factor out both a 4 from a 4 and a 36, and I can get an n to the first out of both an n cubed and an n to the first. So on this one, I'm going to factor out a 4n, and that's going to leave me with an n squared minus 9, and I'm starting to feel good now. Why am I starting to feel good? Because there's an n squared minus 9 here and an n squared minus 9 here, and I'm hoping I get an n squared minus 9 over here. Now, how can I do that? Well. I've got my n squared sitting here. I really need to factor a negative 12 out. So let me do that. Let me factor a negative 12 out. Now that's gonna leave me with an n squared here. But what do I have here? Well, let me just take the calculator out for a second and do 108 divided by negative 12. Hey, hey, hey. 
it's negative 9, right? So this becomes negative 12 times n squared minus 9. Now look what happens. I can take an n squared minus 9. Yes, I'm more excited about this than I should be. Factor it out of everything, and I get n squared plus 4n minus 12. And now I feel very good about things, right? Because the n squared minus 9 I can easily factor, as we talked about before, into n plus 3 and n minus 3. But this second thing is just a standard trinomial. I'm just looking for two numbers with a product of negative 12 and a sum of positive 4, and that happens to be n plus 6 and n minus 2, and that is this polynomial completely factored right there. That's it. Kind of cool, right? And it's, it's neat because it actually employs all three of the major factoring techniques. The first one being to factor out common factors from specific terms within the polynomial, right? Then factor out a common binomial factor from each one of these terms, and then factor a trinomial and a difference of perfect squares. Rock on. That's some factoring. All right. Let's take a look at a pretty easy question in number 12. What is the solution when the equation wx squared plus w is equal to zero is solved for x where w is a positive integer? Honestly, w could have been a positive integer, a negative integer, an irrational number. It could have been anything you wanted it to be. It just can't be zero. All right, uh, so I don't know why they said that. They could have just said where w isn't equal to zero. Well, let's solve it, right? We got wx squared plus w is equal to zero. Let's subtract a w from both sides. Why not? I'll get wx squared is equal to negative w. I'll divide both sides by w. Last time I checked, anytime you divide a negative number by the positive version of the number, you get negative one. All right, so now I have one of the most famous equations in all of algebra two, x squared is equal to negative one. I'm gonna take the square root of both sides. Anytime I take the square root to solve an equation, anytime I take the square root to solve an equation, I introduce a plus minus, right? So I get x equals plus or minus the square root of negative one, and by definition, the square root of negative one is the imaginary number i. Uh, I would love to talk hours and hours about imaginary numbers just to irritate Joey, my producer, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> not going to do it. It's going to come up again on this exam just one more time, but here's, here's our one instance of imaginary numbers. Imagine that. You couldn't solve this, Joey. You'd be stuck. You'd be dead, dead in the water. You'd be like, well, it doesn't have an answer, but I just made one up. It's called I. All right. Let's take a look at 13, which is a lot of gobbledygook, and then we'll get into the meat of it. 13. A group of students was trying to determine the proportion of candies in a bag that are blue. The company claims that 24% of the candies in the bag are blue. Uh, a simulation was run, I wonder what kind of candy they're talking about. A simulation was run 100 times with a sample size of 50 based on the premise, the premise that 24% of the candies are blue. The approximate normal results of the simulation are shown in the dot plot below. Okay, great, thank you so much. I'm just gonna not look at that. All right, let's take a look then at the wording. It really, just if they give you a dot plot, it's, there's a, like a one in 10 chance you actually have to pay attention to it. The results that, you, that matter are down here. The simulation results in a mean of 0.254 and a standard deviation of 0 0.060. Based on this simulation, what is a plausible interval containing the middle 95% of the data? All right, so in other words, okay, now I'm going back to the dot plot. 95% of this sort of falls where, right? I'm just circling what I think is about, you know, 95%. Okay, so here's the thing, and this is going to actually come up a couple times on this exam. Okay, just the one that we're working on now, so you can bet it'll probably come up tomorrow. When you see this 95%, what that means is plus or minus two standard deviations, standards, how about two standard, the, the red through me, deviations as it always does from the mean, all right? So 
One of the things that you should have learned and really kind of harped on when you were in the statistics portion of this course was that when you have most statistical distributions, most, right, then if you want to find where 95% of the data lies, what you do is you add two standard deviations to the mean and you subtract two standard deviations from the mean and that gives you the middle 95% of the data. So it's basically, it's a calculator thing. You take 0.254 and you'd subtract two of those standard deviations. We'll do that on the calculator in a moment. And then, or maybe I'll just kind of write down the answers. And then you do the mean 0.254 plus two of those standard deviations, and that's gonna give you that 95% interval. It's not very interesting. I, can't, I gotta find it in my notes. There, there it is. All right. Uh, the, the lower end um, is 0 0.134. The upper end is 0 0.374, and that's our interval. Um, now, in a little bit of a deeper sense, and we're gonna see this come up later, we kind of think about that 95% interval as being the sort of normal values. They're, they're the ones that are expected, you know, it, okay, we expect those values, nothing unusual, nothing weird, right? It's the ones that are kind of down here and way up here, those are the outliers. And maybe I shouldn't use the word outlier because that's a very specific term in statistics. But those are the unusual values. The values that are above two standard deviations above the mean and the ones that are below two standard deviations below the mean, those are the unusual ones. And that idea is going to come up a little bit later on in one of the free response problems. For now, let's just keep going. Hey, we zoomed again inadvertently. Okay, let's take a look at 14. Selected values for the functions f and g are shown in the tables below. A solution to the equation f of x equals g of x is what? Well, now remember, when we are solving equations graphically, right, we graph the two equations and we find their intersection point. So first things first, I want to find a point in this table that is the same as a point in this table. And there's only one of them. It comes at 8.52 and 2.53, all right? So that is literally the point where these two graphs of the two functions would intersect. Now the problem then becomes, is the answer choice 2, 2.53, or is it choice 4, 8.52? Well, let's be very clear about what we know at this point. We know that f of 8.52 is equal to 2.53. And we know g of 8.52 is equal to 2.53. So I can say with confidence that 8.52 is equal to g of 8.52. And that is the x value, right? That is the solution. We are always, always, always asking what x value makes the y values equal. I don't actually care what the y values are. That's actually what sort of like, you know, that's the 2.53, that's great and all. But I'm just saying, hey, what x values make f of x equal to g of x, and that's an x value of 8.52. The y value is irrelevant. The only thing that's important is that it's the same. All right, oh hey, more imaginary number work. Let's take a look at 15. The expression 6 minus the quantity 3x minus 2i squared is equivalent to which of the following? It's a little bit weird. Um, most of the time in a situation like this, they will actually say where i is equal to the square root of negative 1 to make sure that it's not just some random variable i. Anyway, whatever. So look, what I really have to do is I have to be careful. I've got to square this out and then I've got to subtract it from the number six. So let's just, let's just take a look at that process. Just all about being careful here. I've got six minus three X minus two I times three X minus two I. All right, and I'll put this in kind of like a larger set of parentheses so that we can kind of multiply it all out. This is just foiling, right? 3x times 3x is 9x squared. And then 3x times negative 2i would be 3 times negative 2, which is negative 6, times x times i. 
and then I've got another one, negative six times x times i. Here comes the important one, negative two times negative two is positive four, and i times i is i squared. All right, so what can I do here? Let's continue to simplify what we've got inside. Nothing that I can do with the 9x squared. I can combine a negative 6xi and another negative 6xi to get negative 12xi. And here's the real kicker, right? 4i squared, well, i squared is equal to negative 1, so 4i squared is equal to negative 4, so I get negative 4 here. All right, let me just step back a little bit and let's talk about this. The 9x squared minus 12xi minus 4 is simply the 3x minus 2i quantity squared. And again, where the imaginary numbers come in is in one and only one step, and it's right here. When I change that i squared into a negative 1, which is pretty much the definition of i, right? i is the square root of negative 1, therefore i squared is equal to negative 1. That is the only place the imaginary numbers come in. Now I have to be careful and distribute the subtraction through the parentheses, right? That's going to be 6 minus 9x squared plus 12xi plus 4. I can now combine the positive 4 and the positive 6, and I'll get negative 9x squared plus 12xi plus 10, and that is right here. And of course, they've included all sorts of crazy answers, right, where you may have forgotten to distribute the negative, like here, you know, or where you combine them incorrectly. So just watch out. It's, it's easy. It's not a hard problem, right, to square out that binomial, but it's easy to mess up on the distribution. They will have anticipated some of that. Be careful. All right, let's take a look at number 16. A number minus 20 times its reciprocal is equal to 8. That number is which of the following? All right, well, let's model what's going on here. Now, the real important piece of terminology here is the reciprocal, right? And the reciprocal of any number, if, if I had like a number like 3, its reciprocal would be 1 third. You know, if I had a number like 5, its reciprocal is 1 fifth. Oops, is 1, I'm getting ahead of myself, is 1 fifth. If I have a number like n, its reciprocal is 1 over n. Okay, so the reciprocal of any number is simply 1 over that number. That's, you know, it's a term you've been seeing for a while. But now let's model what's going on here, right? It says a number, let's just call it n, minus 20 times its reciprocal is equal to 8. All right, great. Well, I'm going to solve this equation. This is a little rational equation. We get, uh, I'm going to make this a little bit different. We get n minus 20 over n is equal to 8. I like solving these types of equations by multiplying by the least common denominator. We're going to see a beast of a problem like this come up later, which is going to be worth two points, which is nuts. Anyway, when I distribute this through, I'll get n squared minus 20 is equal to 8n. All right, anytime I have a quadratic equation, I'm going to lean towards setting it equal to zero, factoring and setting each factor equal to zero. So I'm going to bring that 8n over to the other side. I'll get n squared minus 8n minus 20 is equal to zero, right? I can factor this. Here comes that connection between factors and zeros. That's going to be n minus 10 times n plus 2, right? If n minus 10 is a factor, then n equals 10 is a zero. If n plus 2 is a factor, n equals negative 2 is a zero. And there's our answer, 10 or negative 2. Now, you could actually just kind of like, if you can get the equation written down, you could then sort of guess and check to see which one of those things make it true and which ones don't. But again, the idea is to learn how to solve one of these rational equations by doing this technique of clearing out the denominator. Ooh. Oh boy, there's a lot to unpack in number 17. So first I'm gonna have a little drink of lemonade. Yeah. Okay, number 17. A savings account S has an initial value of $50. The account grows at a 2% interest rate compounded n times per year, t, according to the function below. S of t equals 50 times 1 plus 0.02 divided by n raised to the n t. Which statement about the account is correct? Okay, so 
This is kind of cool, right? You should have talked a decent amount, at least a couple days, two, three days, on what's known as compound interest. And this is really cool because you're always given interest rates in terms of how much you're given per year, but that interest could get divided up and then applied multiple times per year. So look, if, if, this, if this thing is happening once per year, right, then all you get is a function that looks like this. Whoops, yeah, that looks like this. All right, if, if the interest just gets applied each year at the end of the year, then you just get to multiply by 1.02 raised to the T. But let's say that you, you did it on a monthly basis. If you did it on a monthly basis, the first thing that you'd have to do is to divide that 2% up by 12 months, but then you'd get to compound it by 12 times per year. So the, the power now wouldn't be just T, but it would be 12 times T. And by the way, that's better you'd get more interest, all right? Now, let's say you got to compound it daily. Well, if you got to compound it daily, let's assume 365 days per year, all right? Then you'd get something like that and it would go up even further, right? All right, now, the most you can possibly do is what's called continuous compounding. Now that's kind of a weird, almost magical idea that really gets into the realm of calculus and yet it's gonna show up in Algebra 2 for some almost inexplicable reason. But the idea is if that number gets really big at the same time that number is because they're the same number, right? If they go to infinity, then what happens is that all of this goes to 50 times e to the 0.02t. So when the compounding becomes continuous, it's happening all the time, every moment of every, I'm not talking about every second, not every millisecond, I'm talking about it's happening all the time. So there's an infinity sort of down here and an infinity up there. This all becomes 50 times e raised to the, not 1.02t, but 0.02 to times t, 0.02 times t. So let's find it, that ends up being choice two. As the value of n increases, the value of the account approaches s of t equals 50 times e to the 0.02t. But let's take a look at some of the other choices which are incorrect. Number one, as the value of n increases, the amount of interest per year decreases. No, 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 no. The more that you compound per year, the more interest you're gonna get up to that continuous compounding, right? Uh, let's take a look at three, which is also incorrect. As the value of n decreases to one, the amount of interest per year increases. Again, that's really saying the same thing as number one. This one says as n increases, the amount that you get decreases. This one says as n decreases, the amount you get increases. Congratulations for saying the same thing in two different ways. And choice four, as the value of n decreases to the value of the account, right? To decreases to one, right? So you're only doing it one time per year. The value of the account approaches the function 50 times one, one minus 0.02 to the T. Well, that's crazy. As N goes to one, this just becomes one plus 0.02 to the T. I don't know why it would suddenly become negative. That's just strange. But anyway, there, there's a lot going on here, especially the idea that as we go to infinity, as we you know increase the, uh, the, the frequency with which we compound the interest in an account, we end up using this natural base E to calculate the interest that we're getting. Oh my. Okay. By the time I got done with that answer, I didn't even understand what I was talking about. Problem 18. There are 400 students in the senior class at Oak Creek High School. Of all, all of these students took the SAT. The distribution of their SAT scores is approximately normal. The number of students who scored within two standard deviations of the mean is approximately what? All right, this is the second time it's come up. Do you remember? Way back when we had that weird dot plot and that stat problem, they were like, well, it's a plausible interval within the 95% uh, of the data. And I said, well, add uh, and subtract two standard deviations. Well, it's the same thing here, except a little bit reverse, right? When they say within two standard deviations of the mean, that's 95% of the data. 95% of the data, roughly 95% of the data will, will, will be within two standard deviations of the mean. So if I want to figure out how many things are within two standard deviations of the mean, I just find 95% of 400, all right, easy enough by just doing 0.95 times 400, and I get 380. Done, that's it. 
The 95% interval is an important interval in statistics. As I mentioned before, it's mostly important from the perspective of we think of like values within that interval as being normal and values outside of that interval as being unusual, right? Because they only have a 5% chance of happening, right? And that's split up on both ends. So like on the high end, there's only a 2.5% and on the low end, there's only a 2.5%. Okay, I've almost dreaded talking about the next problem, but let's do it. Number 19. The solution set for the equation b equals the square root of 2b squared minus 64 is, and then they give you four choices. Now, the reason that I kind of dreaded talking about it is not because it's a hard problem. It's actually because it's an exceptionally easy problem. All right, I can look at this problem and immediately know that the answers are not one or three. Okay, and I can know that immediately for one reason. On the right hand side, there's a square root symbol. And in front of that square root symbol, even though it's not written, there's a positive sign. Okay, one of the most misunderstood ideas in all of math is that the square root of, let's say, 16 is both plus and minus 4. Okay, it's not. That is one of the most just misunderstood ideas in all of math. Now, don't get me wrong. There, every number, every number except for a zero, has two square roots, a positive square root and a negative square root. But there's a way we distinguish between the two, and the way we distinguish between the two is whether there's a plus or a minus sitting out here. So be very clear, the square root of 16, written this way, really, we should never say is the square root of 16. I should always be saying the positive square root of 16, right? And that's this. And this is this, right? This is not equal to negative four, and this is not equal to positive four. And that's gotta be the way it is, because if it wasn't, then if we had something like this, if this always gave both a positive and a negative result, this wouldn't be a function. You'd have no square root function whatsoever, right? So this says, right, that b equals the positive square root of 2b squared minus 64. So whatever is on the right-hand side must be positive. So whatever is on the left-hand side must also be positive for it to be a solution, which means negative 8 can't be a solution, and plus or minus, plus or minus 8 can't be a solution because it includes negative 8. The only question really is, is 8 a solution? And 8 is a solution. You can see that by simply substituting it in. Right? If I put 8 in, I'll get 2 times 8 squared minus 64, which is kind of funny because that's 2 times 64 minus 64, which I believe is just 164, and then 8 equals 8. And yes, 8 is a solution. But what you can't do is put a negative 8 here, a negative 8 here, a negative 8 here, and suddenly put a negative in front of the square root sign and say, oh, negative 8 is equal to negative 8 because the square root of 64 is both plus and minus 8. No, this is just 8, only 8. Now, if they had a negative sign sitting there, if the, if the question was b equals negative root 2b squared minus 64, then I would know the answer couldn't be positive because the right-hand side would have to be negative if there's a negative sign sitting out there. But it's the most confused thing ever, and I get it, because we constantly see things like this, and then we do this, and then somehow magically it becomes this. And really, we really should be putting a plus minus right there, right from the beginning, because x squared equals 25 definitely has two answers, both plus and minus five, all right? Anyway. Very simple question, but it throws people off constantly. All right, number 20. Which table best represents an exponential relationship? I love the fact that it's best represents. Well, again, an exponential relationship is like a geometric sequence. The idea is to go from one y value to the next y value, you are constantly multiplying 
or dividing by the same number. And in this particular case, right away, it happens to be choice one. Because when we look at this, what's happening is to go from eight to four, we would multiply it by one half. To go from four to two, we would multiply by one half. To go from two to one, we would multiply by one half. And to go from one to one half, we would multiply by one half. So in each case, we're multiplying by one half to go from one entry to the next entry, or one output, sorry, to the next output, and therefore it's this one. Now, by the way, if you look at the other choices, they're kind of cool. Choice two, what's happening to the y's is they're just going up by one for each, you know, four unit of increase in x. This is just a linear function, right, with a slope of one fourth. Here, notice the y values are 0, 1, 4, 9, 16. Hopefully you recognize those as perfect squares. This is just the equation y equals x squared. This one is 1, 8, 27, 64, 125. These outputs are all these inputs cubed. This is just y equals x cubed. Now, even though y equals x squared and y equals x cubed have exponents in them, they are not exponential relationships. They are not that. Right, an exponential relationship, each y value ends up being the same factor, getting produced by multiplying by the same factor times the previous y value. That sounded weird. Okay, <laughs> let's go to 21. A sketch of r of x is shown below. All right, we're coming back to the correspondence between zeros and roots with one interesting wrinkle. All right, so we see this polynomial, right? And it has one zero at x equals negative c. Like for example, let's say x equals negative five. Right, we don't know what c is, but I'm just going to make up an example. Right, it's got one zero at x equals negative c. It's got one zero at x equals negative b. So like, for example, uh, x equals, maybe make it smaller, x equals negative two. And then it's got a zero at x equals a, right? And that's a positive one. So let's say, for example, x equals three, just to make it kind of different. Right Now remember what that would imply is it would imply a factor of x plus c, a factor of x plus b, and a factor of x minus a. So for our examples that would be like x plus 5, uh, x plus 2, and x minus 3. Right, So that would be kind of it. Now you have to watch out because if you look what you'll find Right here, x plus c, x plus b, x minus a, there it is, right? The problem is that this particular zero is what's called a tangent zero. All right, now, a tangent zero actually means that the zero happens more than once. And specifically, it means it must happen an even number of times, most often just squared. Okay, technically speaking, these guys that aren't tangent zeros, those could be to the first, or they could be to the third, the fifth, the seventh, etc. So it's really kind of cool. Zeros can repeat themselves, obviously. You can have like x minus two times x minus two. That's a x equals two zero that repeats itself. And whenever zeros repeat themselves an even number of times, the graph then is tangent to the x-axis. Whenever they repeat themselves an odd number of times, then it goes through here. So that x plus c has to at least be to the second power, and that ends up being choice four. And again, you can test this one if you simply pick values. And if you said, oh, I think it's gonna be this one, and you put it in, you'd see a totally different graph. All right, you'd see a cubic graph, not a what's called a quartic graph. Hey, our first trig problem, 22. The temperature in degrees Fahrenheit and times squared during a day in August can be predicted by the function t of x equals eight times sine of the quantity 0.3x minus three plus 74, where x is the number of hours after midnight. That's really important in this problem. According to this model, the predicted temperature to the nearest degree Fahrenheit at 7 p.m. is what? All right, well, really, this is a plug and chug problem. I just have to plug the value of x in and evaluate this and see what I get. 
But my first problem simply is, what is the value of x, right? So x is the number of hours since midnight, and I'm talking about 7 p.m. So you gotta think about this a little bit. If I'm going from midnight to 7 p.m. first, right, let me go from midnight to 7 a.m., right? So from midnight to, actually, let's go noon, that's gonna be 12 hours, right? Then from noon to 7 p.m., that's going to be another seven hours. So X is actually 19, right? And you really got to watch out for that because you can just bet. You can bet. They figured out what the answer is when X is seven, and that's one of the wrong choices here, right? So this problem is as much about understanding where X equals zero is and what the X value is that you plug in as anything else. Now. Let's actually plug that value in. Let me just get my notes out so that I can take a look at the equation. Let's come over. Now, one thing that's very, very important. Last night I was doing the geometry review and on geometry there's a bunch of right triangle trig where all the angles are measured in degrees. But in this particular problem, we're using what's called a sinusoidal model. And there, in all of those models, in all of those models, your calculator must be in the radian mode. Radian mode, not degree mode. I have to have rad sitting up here. If I've got degree sitting up there and I plug that thing in, it's gonna be wrong. So all right, let me put my, my expression in. Let me clear all of this stuff out real quick just to, uh, hold on. Um, let's see, I want actions. Let me uh, clear history, great. All right, so let me put it in. I've got eight times, good, I'm still there. Eight times the sine of 0 0.3 times x, remember that was 19. All right, minus three, I gotta close my parentheses, that's important, plus 74. All right, all I've done is taken that equation and I've just put 19 in for x. That's all I've done, but again, really critical that my calculator's in radian mode, I hit enter, my answer is 77, okay? Side note, if I put this thing in degree mode real quick and I hit enter again, Right, look at the difference in the answer, 74. I wonder if 74 is one of the choices. Remember, 77 is the right answer. Oh man, 74 is one of the answers. Oh God, that's terrible. All right, anyway, um, yeah, that's really unfortunate. By the way, you know, here I'm, I'm kind of curious. I'm gonna put it back into radiance. Um, one thing I'm, I'm curious about, because I, I didn't do this, and I'm worried that my calculator is now gonna go a little nutsy on me, but um, I wonder like, if I put seven in here instead of the 19 for seven hours. Let's see, that would be 68. Oh, you bet, that's choice one. Yeah, they, they pulled out all the stops. So you're gonna get a, you're gonna, you're gonna do everything right on this problem in, in, in terms of your calculator work, you know, in terms of putting like the seven in or the 19 in or whatever, but if you're in the wrong mode or you, you interpret X wrong, it's all over on this one. All right, oh God, <laughs> sorry, I was taking only 23. <laughs> <laughs> Consider the system of equations below. x plus y minus z equals 6. 2x minus 3y plus 2z equals negative 19. Negative x plus 4y minus z equals 17. Which number is not the value of any variable in the solution to this system? Oh my goodness. So this, this could easily be a four point problem on this test. And it's a two point multiple choice problem. Now, there are ways of making this problem exceptionally easy on your calculator. The problem is there's multiple ways of doing that. And you know, it differs depending on which calculator you have. Um, there's things called row reduced echelon and matrices and all sorts of stuff that, that actually makes solving one of these quite easy, which is probably why the people that created these tests felt just fine about putting one of them on, on part one, because they probably expect all teachers to just show kids how to do these things on your calculator. That's unfortunate. I'm gonna do it by hand. I'm gonna try to do it fast by hand. All right, uh, but here we go, right? We're gonna solve this thing by using the method of elimination, okay? And the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna notice that if I took the first equation, let me number these equations, one, two, three. If I add equations one and two together, or sorry, one and three together, my apologies. If I take one and I add three to it, 
What will happen is I'll have an x here and a negative x here cancel out. I'll get x plus 4y, which is 5y. I'll get negative z plus negative z, which is 2z. And then I'll get 6 plus 17, which is equal to 23. All right, so if I just add the first equation to the last equation, what happens is that those x ends, x's end up canceling out. Now what I'd really like to do is do the same thing and get x to cancel again, so I'm left with two equations with two unknowns. Now nothing else that I do will just immediately have things cancel out like that, but let's say I took equation three and I multiplied both sides by negative two. So let's say I just took this thing and I multiplied this, I'm gonna just move this uh, negative three out a little bit. Whoops, sorry. I'm gonna put the three out here. Let's say I, I multiplied this by two and this by two, right? What would happen is I'd get negative two x plus eight y minus two z is equal to 34. And then if I added that to the second equation, which is two x minus three y, plus 2z is equal to negative 19. So again, let me just, before I add them together, just make sure you understand what I did. I multiplied the third equation by two on both sides, and I'm gonna add it to the second equation, and I'm gonna have a twofer. And that's why this problem is actually doable by hand in part one, because when I add these two equations together, negative 2x and positive 2x cancel, 8y and negative 3y becomes 5y, and then I have a negative 2z and a positive 2z, and they also cancel. 34 plus negative 19 is 15. And again, the key here is because both x and z canceled in this maneuver, now I can solve for y. y is equal to three, right? I've got one of the variables. Once I've got one value, all the other three unlock very quickly, all the other two unlock very quickly. I can now take three and plug it into this equation for y, and that gives me five times three minus two times z is equal to 23. Five times three is 15, so 15 minus two z is equal to 23. Subtract 15 from both sides, can't believe I'm showing you that. Uh, negative two z is equal to eight. Divide by negative two on both sides, and z is equal to negative four. So now I have three and negative four, by the way, that, that, now I just have to figure out what x is. I can figure out what x is by going to any one of these equations. I'll just do the first one, x plus y minus z. Gotta be a little careful there. Wait a second here. x plus y. Oh, it's equal to six. Sorry, I'm getting very messy. I get x plus seven is equal to six, and I get x equals negative one. So the one that isn't a member of the solution is two. Whoa, Nilly. Again, if you know ways to do this on the calculator, awesome. If you don't, I don't think it's probably worth me trying to do it right now and like really confusing you, especially if you have a different calculator. I mean, question 24 is gonna be confusing enough, so let's just move on to that one. All right, let's take a look. Cameron puts $400 into a savings account that earns 6% annually. The amount in her account can be modeled by C of t equals 400 times 1.06 raised to the t, and this is key, where t is the time in years. Which expression best approximates the amount of money in her account using a weekly growth rate? Okay, so here's the thing, and this is really critical. If they define a variable to be time with a particular unit, then that variable stays as that measurement in that unit throughout the problem. Now for a moment, let's just think about how this would be modeled in terms of weeks. I'm gonna like call this C of W for weeks, and that would be 400 times some base that I don't know raised to the number of weeks. Okay, so it's 400 times that base I don't know, right? That weekly growth rate. Okay, raised to the number of weeks. But how does the number of weeks relate to the number of years? Well, the number of weeks will always be 52 times the number of years. Always. All right, right? I mean, if I, if I wanna know how many weeks have gone by, 
you know, uh, and I said, hey, three years have passed, you'd say, oh, well, there's 52 weeks in a year, so three times 52, right? So the number of weeks equals 52 times the number of years, which means I can now rewrite this as C of T equals 400 times B raised to the 52T. All right. So it's either going to be this one or it's going to be this one. Now, which one is it? Well, I can convert this one into this one with a real sly maneuver, okay? Uh, so I'm gonna like erase this for a second, right? I can take 400 to the 1.06 and I can raise it to the 152nd and then have a 52T out here. Let me get rid of this so we have a little bit of space here. All right, now let me explain this little maneuver, right? 152nd times 52, those two cancel, and I'm just right back up here. So these two things are the same model. In fact, I could do this for anything. Like, a, like let's say I had monthly, not weekly. I could put a 12 here, and I could put a 112th here, right? Uh, I could do daily. I could have a 365 here, and I could do a 1 over 365 there, because remember, exponent laws say that these two just multiply by each other, and they just give you to the first, 1.06 to the first. So now let's figure out what 1.06 to the 152nd is. And you can bet I have to do that on my calculator. Okay, so I got 1.06 raised to the 152nd, and that's 1.011, da 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 right? And that is choice four, all right? This will happen every once in a while in these exams where they ask you to go from one time scale to another. It's oftentimes from a larger time scale, like a year, down to a smaller time scale, like a week or a day or a month or something like that. The way that you can always do it right, with these exponential models, is you can take your original time scale and multiply it by how many of the smaller time scales fit inside of it. In this case, there are 52 weeks in a year, so we multiply by 52. We then can sort of undo that by raising that original base to the one over whatever that was. So let's say we were compounding it on a quarterly basis. We would rewrite that as four times t, and then we would raise that 1.06 to the one fourth to figure out what our quarterly interest rate was. Here it's weekly, so we raise it to the 152nd. Hey, we're into part twos. All right, let's take a little break. It is 7.30, so we're about halfway through um, our time. We're more than halfway through the exam, though. Uh, take just a little moment. Now, of course, as you're probably well aware, all of the part one problems, all 24 of those problems are worth two points each and there's no partial credit. It's either right or wrong. You know, you may have done all the work right, done a beautiful job, and then bubbled in the wrong answer. That's the way the ball bounces. You got to watch out on those. Now we move into eight part two questions. Each one of them are worth exactly the same amount as the multiple choice questions were, but you need to show your work and you could get partial credit if, let's say, you make a small mistake here or there. One of the problems with the part two questions, especially on the algebra two exam, is they often tend to be more than just like two steps, right? And we're gonna see one that is like a beast and a half. I'm like, this thing could easily be a four pointer, kind of like that system equation that we just saw. But let's start off with a pretty easy one in number 25. The table below shows the number of hours of daylight on the first day of each month in Rochester, New York. Go Rochester, yeah, RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology. Anyway, uh, given the data, let me make this shrink down a little bit so we can see it maybe a bit better. Let's go to 150. Uh, given the data, what is the average rate of change in hours of daylight per month from January 1st to April 1st? Okay, so we're looking for an average rate of change and it's a little bit strange here because we're looking to go from January 1st to April 1st, right? Now you think about that, right? January to February to March to April, right? We're talking about the change over three months, right? Not four months. You're not like, oh, January, February, March, April. It's January to February, February to March, March to April. There's only three months that are elapsing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take 13.9 
minus 9.4 all divided by 3. Now let's also keep track of our units. In the numerator, those are hours of daylight, right? And then in the denominator, we have months, okay? So let's just figure out what that is real quick. We'll just go over to the calculator really fast. Uh, I think we'll just throw in a fraction bar. We've got our 13.9 minus 9.4 all divided by those three months. And we get 1.5, right? And specifically, we get 1.5 hours per month. Now, they did, you know, tell us those were going to be the units anyway, but it's kind of instructive of the fact that they've got them there. Now, remember, this is a two-point problem. That's one point, right? Then, second part of this problem, interpret what that means in the context of the problem. Okay, right? Well, in the context of the problem, what that means is that the, the daily hours of daylight are increasing by an average whew, of 1.5 hours per month from January 1st to April 1st. Now, you know, honestly, I didn't go back and really look at the grading rubric really hard on this one in terms of what they took for full credit and what they didn't. In my mind, you really have to have all of this. The daily hours of daylight are increasing by an average of 1.5 hours per month from January 1st to April 1st. It can't just be like, well, the daylight's increasing by 1.5 hours. You know, that's definitely not going to get the job done. It's got to be 1.5 hours per month, right? And I, in my personal opinion, you got to say from January 1st to April 1st. But I bet you probably don't have to do that. Anyway, let's take a look at a real beast of a part two question. Number 26. Algebraically solve for x. 7 over 2x minus 2 over x plus 1 equals 1 over 4. All right, now there are lots of ways of doing this problem, all right, and it's a little tricky. There's two primary ways. One way is to combine the two fractions on the left-hand side to get one fraction here, one fraction here, and then to cross multiply. Another way of doing it is by multiplying all three of the fractions by their least common denominator in order to cancel the fractions out. Now, either way, of course, you're going to get the same answers, and they're both kind of beasts, to be honest with you, and you're going to end up with a quadratic equation that you'll have to factor and get the two roots of. So there's a lot of work, and you're only going to get two points out of this, and I'm still debating in my head which way I want to do it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't know. Let me first um, fit with, I like them both, but it's always like, we're not going to do them both. Uh, so let's go with multiplying everything by the least common denominator. And what I want to be thinking about is when I look at 2x, x plus 1, and 4, right, I could multiply everything by the expression 4x times x plus 1, and it'll cancel stuff, right? So, like, the 4x will cancel the 2x, the x plus 1 will cancel an x plus 1, and the 4 here will take care of the 4 here. The one thing that's a little bit confusing is the 4x and the 2x, but we'll deal with that for in a second. So I'm going to multiply this entire side by 4x times x plus 1, and I'm going to multiply this entire side by 4x times x plus 1. And I apologize if you're one of those kind of people that wanted to do the common denominator approach. Side note, if you want to do the common denominator approach, the common denominator on this side would be 2x times x plus 1, right? And then you could kind of summarize them. Anyway, so I'm going to distribute this to both of these things. Let me just kind of do that step. I think that it's helpful. Times 7 divided by 2x minus 4x times x plus 1. Uh, let me put these all in terms of fractions. I know that that helps some people. Times 2 over x plus 1 equals, and then I'll do 1 fourth times 
4x times x plus 1 all over 1. All right, so we've just distributed. Now let's do some canceling. Now here, an x cancels an x, and a 2 cancels a 4, but it does leave us a 2. That's a little bit annoying, but we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it. Here, x plus 1's cancel. That's all good. And here, 4's cancel. All right, so here's the part that might be the worst situation. I've got 2 times 7, which is 14, and then I've got 14 times x plus 1. So if I distribute that 14 to save myself a line, I'll get 14x plus 14. Now I'm going to get 4x times 2, which is just negative 8x. On this side, I've got x times x plus 1, which is going to be x squared plus x. All right, so this technique where we multiply both sides of a rational equation by something that will cancel all the denominators, we saw earlier when we saw another two-point problem that was n minus 20 over n equals 8. Remember that one, that multiple choice problem that was much easier than this but worth exactly the same amount? Okay, so anyway, in this problem, we now have to get everything equal to zero, factor, and solve. So I think since my x squared is over here, I'm going to leave it over here. Well, actually, let me combine like terms on this side first. I've got the 14x and the 8x. That's going to be 6x plus 14 is equal to x squared plus x. If I subtract the 6x and the 14 in order to get everything equal to 0, all right, that's going to end up giving me 0 is equal to x squared minus 5x minus 14. Whew. 0 equals x minus 7 times x plus 2 x minus 7 equals 0, x equals 7, and x plus 2 is equal to 0, and x equals negative 2. All right, the only, the only thing that's a little dicey on these problems where you've got fractions involved in an equation is whether either one of these two zeros should be rejected because maybe it makes one of the denominators into zero. That doesn't actually happen in this problem. You can look at the original denominators, which are 2x and x plus 1. The only x values that wouldn't have been allowed would be x equals negative 1 here and x equals 0 here. Neither one of those are our solutions, so they're both legit and we're ready to move on from that two-point problem. Hey, going back to the calculator, let's take a look at 27. Graph f of x equals log base 2 of x plus 6 on the graph on the set of axes below. All right, well, you know, in a certain sense, this is a very easy problem because we can put the equation into our calculator. So let, let's take a look. Um, I'm going to, uh, I think, um, I think I'm going to open up a whole new document just so I can start a new graph. I'm going to no on that. Let's add a graph. Okay, so what did we have? Well, what we had was the logarithm. All right, and we had base 2 of x plus 6. Okay, there's my graph. Now, ultimately, I got to make my graph look like this. It's got to look like this. Now, logarithms are notorious for having lots of messy y values. Okay, one thing I should notice, though, count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Notice x equals 6, the vertical line x equals 6 would be right here. And what's happening is that this function has what's known as a vertical asymptote. As it approaches x equals 6, it heads down towards negative infinity, and you must have that feature on your graph. If you don't, then they're going to they're gonna doink you for, for some points. So now, if we want to get actual values, it's very easy. Let me just kind of erase this. I'm going to get myself a table, right? Choice 7, split screen table. All right, I'm going to kind of go backwards a little bit. Uh, again, notice what happens here. You know, at negative 6, we're undefined. At negative 5, we're at 0. At negative 4, we're at 1. At negative 2, we're at 2, etc. Okay. Um, so let me go back to my document here. So I could kind of like create a little x, y table here, right? So when x was negative 5, y was 0. When x was negative 4, y was 1. x was negative 2, y is 2. x is 2, y was 3. All the way out there at x equals 10, y was 4. Let's just plot these values and see where we land. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, negative 4, 1. Negative 2, 2. 2, 3, and 10, 
and four. Now, one thing that you really gotta watch out for is if that's your whole graph, they're gonna give you one out of two points. What you're expected to know is that at whatever x value makes that equal to zero, so whatever x value makes the argument of the logarithm equal to zero, you have this thing called a vertical asymptote. The best way to draw that is a dashed vertical line. Think of it as a wall that your function cannot get past and bends down towards but doesn't touch, all right? And so therefore that becomes our graph. Again, take a look at that graph. If we stop it at the x-axis, you can understand why the graders would take off points. There is part of the function right there. If we stop it though, because we say, well, at negative six it's undefined and at negative five it's equal to zero, so there's nothing in there, you know, then they're gonna zap us for a point. So we gotta watch that. Logarithms have vertical asymptotes, just as their inverses exponentials have horizontal asymptotes. Okay, 28, we're back to trig. Let's take a look. Given tan theta equals seven divided by 24 and theta terminates in quadrant three, determine the value of cosine theta. All right, so this is easiest done by actually going back to uh, geometry from, or sorry, going back to right triangle trig from geometry, right? We remember from geometry that the trigonometric ratios were originally defined in terms of a right triangle and Sokotoa, right? And we knew that the tangent was the opposite side over the adjacent side. So we could do a little right triangle that looks like this, 7 24 all right? Now, what I really need, because I'm looking for the value of cosine theta, and of course we know that cosine of theta is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse, right? We know that. Well, I need my hypotenuse. Now, I can easily figure that out using the Pythagorean theorem, right? So I could just do a little bit of... Uh, 24 squared plus 7 squared equals c squared. Ultimately, we would get c equals 25. So let me save some suspense here. We would do the Pythagorean theorem. We'd add these up. We'd take the square root of both sides. We'd get c equals 25, right? That would be my hypotenuse. Now, it would be very tempting then to say, well, then of course, cosine theta is equal to 24 25ths. The problem here is this is when we have to diverge from our right triangle trig and go to our algebra two trig, right? The fact is we're in quadrant three, right? And in quadrant three, one, two, three, four, in quadrant three, the cosine is negative, right? So. All three of them are positive in quadrant one. In quadrant two, cosine is negative, sine is positive, tangent is negative. In quadrant three, both the sine and the cosine are negative, but the tangent is positive. And in quadrant four, the cosine is positive, the sine is negative, and the tangent is negative. Now you probably learned some mnemonic, like all students take calculus or something like that, to remember which ones are positive in which quadrants. Others of you hopefully learned that the, these functions are defined by what's known as the unit circle, and the fact that the x-coordinate is the cosine, and the y-coordinate is the sine. But either way, you have to know in quadrant three, cosine is negative, so you can tag that on. As always, this is a two-point problem. So if you get cosine theta equals 24 25ths, great, you'll get one out of two points, and that's awesome. But you gotta have it as negative 24 25ths to get full credit. Okay, number 29, Kenzie. Kenzie believes that for x greater than or equal to zero, the expressions, whew, the seventh root of x squared times the fifth root of x cubed is equal to the 35th root of x to the sixth. Is she correct? Justify your response algebraically. All right, I like this one. This one's gonna let us really kind of dig deep into exponent laws, or at least into a few exponent laws. So let's just play around with this particular expression. So what do we have? Well, I really wanna use exponent properties, so I'm gonna turn each one of those roots into their equivalent exponents. So we have x squared to the 1 7th 
times x cubed to the 1 fifth. All right, I'm not gonna worry about like that 35th root of x to the sixth right now. Now, our first exponent property says we can multiply those two exponents together, right? So I have x to the 2 sevenths times x to the 3 fifths. Now, many of you, all right, many of you will automatically go from here down to here. That's okay, that's not a problem. If you see you know, the seventh root of x squared and you immediately write it as x to the two sevenths, that's fine because you learned that the seven is the denominator and the two is the numerator, etc. that's great. Now at this point, whenever we multiply two things with the same base, we add their exponents. So it's absolutely critical at this point that you show this step, x to the two sevenths plus three fifths. Now it's long, long past time when you should know how to add two fractions, but for goodness sakes, you also have the calculator. So just for a moment, right, I can easily, easily, right, go to a calculator and just go, okay, I need to know what two sevenths plus three fifths is, I think that's what it was, and that's 31 30 fifths. So this is x to the 31 30 fifths. And now I finally have it at a point when I can compare it to what Kenzie believes is the case. Now Kenzie believes it's equal to the 35th root of x to the sixth, right? And think about why she probably thinks that, right? She would get it to be equal to this if she took these two exponents and multiplied them, right? Because two times three would be six, seven times five would be 35, but that's not what Kenzie should be doing at this point. She should be adding them, getting this, which is then not equal to x to the 6 35ths, so the answer is no. And we've justified it algebraically with everything we've done here. Okay, nice exponent problem. Oh, I like 32. I mean, I like 30 as well. I, I might like 32, but we'll get there in a little bit. Anyway, number 30. When the function p of x is divided by x minus 1, the quotient is x squared plus 7 plus 5 divided by x minus 1. State p of x in standard form. Well, this is an interesting twist on things. You probably spent a lot, a lot of time in Algebra 2 taking, I don't know, polynomials like x cubed plus 5x squared minus 8x plus 13, I'm just tossing this out there, and dividing them by these things using either polynomial long division or possibly synthetic division if your teacher showed you that cool technique, right? So anyway, you probably spent a lot of time going from here to here. You probably didn't spend much time going from here to figuring out what was in the numerator. So there's a little bit of an irritating problem in that sense. But let's take it, you know, just for what it's worth, right? When it says p of x is divided by x minus one, the result, the quotient, is x squared plus 7 plus 5 divided by x minus 1, right? That's really what it's saying. And it wants us to figure out what p of x is. Well, here's an idea for you. Let's just solve for it, right? And the way that we can solve for it is by multiplying by x minus 1 on both sides, right? Because then those x minus 1s go away and we're left with p of x. Now, remember, this is a two-point problem. As soon as you write this down, you're gonna get one out of two points. All right, now, let's finish it off. Now, the way we're gonna finish it off is by doing some selective grouping. We're gonna multiply this by this, we're gonna multiply this by this. So what will I get here? Well, I'll get x, plus, x squared plus seven times x minus one, and then when I multiply these two together, the x minus ones will cancel, and I'll be left with plus five. I'll be left with that remainder, as we call it. Now, unfortunately, this is not still in standard form because we need to multiply these two out. And I can use foiling, but I should be careful when I foil here, right? I have x squared times, whoops, missed. I have x squared times x, which is x cubed. I have x squared times negative one, which is negative x squared. I have seven times x, which is seven x. And I've got seven times negative one, which is negative seven, can't leave off the plus five. And finally, p of x is equal to x cubed minus x squared plus 7x minus 2. And that's it. There are definitely other ways to solve this particular problem, 
But that's really the most straightforward way of doing it. And we gotta be getting through these. Oh my goodness. Number 31. Write a recursive formula for the sequence 6, 9, 13.5, 20.25. Man, how many times are they going to have geometric sequences come up on this particular test? Um, now, I already gave away the, 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 the bag, right? I mean, it's going to be a geometric sequence, but just for a moment, right? There are really two types of sequences that you've studied. Geometric sequences, where you go from one number to the next by multiplying by the same number each time. And arithmetic sequences, where you go from one number to the next one by adding or subtracting the same amount each time. Now, you can automatically tell it's not arithmetic, because if it were arithmetic, right, this would be plus 3, this would be plus 4.5, this would be plus some number I don't want to think about. I think it would be six and a half, six and three quarters, something like that. I hope that's right. Uh, whoops. Six and three quarters. Nine, ten, ten. Yeah, okay. Anyway, if it was arithmetic, the amount that I'd add each time would stay the same. It's not arithmetic, right? It's geometric. All right, which means you're going to multiply by the same amount each time. Now, what do you have to multiply by? Well, you can figure that out, that common ratio, by just doing the first number divided by the second number. 9 divided by 6 is 1.5. Now, if you're not sure that it's the same one each time, then you take your calculator out and you go, well, let me see if 13.5 divided by 9 is 1.5. Oh, it is. Great. Okay, so that's also times 1.5. And just to make sure, let's make sure 20.25. Actually, I can do it this way. 13.5 times 1.5 equals 20.25. So that's also times 1.5. So this is a geometric sequence where the first term is 6 and the common ratio is 1.5. Now we got to talk about this piece, a recursive formula. Right? So there's two types of formulas for sequences. One is called an explicit formula, which also sounds a little bit questionable. But um, you know, an explicit formula is one where you literally say, a of n equals 6 times 1.5 to the n minus 1. You literally give a formula where you plug the value of n in and you get the value of the term out. A recursive sequence, a recursive formula, is one where you always state the first value, always. You must state a1 equals 6. Must state this. If you don't, you've lost one point immediately, right? You state the first value. And then you say, well, a n, some random value, is equal to the last value, in this case, times 1.5. So my first value is 6, and every value can be calculated by taking the previous value and multiplying by 1.5. And you can understand why, if you leave this off, this isn't good enough. What? Th this, this, this isn't good enough. Because if, if I don't give you the first number, then, then how do you generate the sequence? You can never get to the second value because you don't know what the first value is. And if I give you the first value, but I don't give you this rule, then you're stuck with the first value and you can't go any further. So absolutely both of them are critical to have. Of course, the common error is figuring out the whole 1.5 thing, writing this down and being like, I got it, and then moving on and never writing this down, which is why I put that must stay. Man, there's a lot of room for that problem. All right, here we go again. Number 32, giant stat plot distribution. Robin flips a coin 100 times that lands heads up 43 times, and she wonders if the coin is unfair. I mean, shouldn't it turn up exactly 50 times? Anyway, she runs a computer simulation of 750 samples of 100 fair coin flips. The output of the proportion of heads is shown below with a mean of 0.499, shocking, most of the time heads come up half the time, right? And a standard deviation of 0.049. Okay, great. Do the results of the simulation provide strong evidence, this is key, strong evidence that Robin's coin is unfair? Explain your answer. All right, so here's what it boils down to, and it's actually kind of cool. Right? So we would expect when Robin flips a coin 100 times for it to land heads up 50 times a lot. That's the, what's known as the expected value. The question is, if it lands 43 times instead of 50, is that unusual enough for us to go, hmm, maybe this coin isn't fair? Now, 
Take it another way. Let's say Robin flipped the coin a hundred times and it came up heads twice. And it came up tails 98 times. You'd start to think to yourself that that might be a loaded coin. A coin that was designed to come up uh, tails instead of heads, right? But 43, is that unusual enough? Well, honestly, again, I don't care about any of this stuff. I only care about these two numbers. And what I'm gonna do is construct the two standard deviation interval again. So again, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my mean, 0.499, and I'm gonna subtract two of those standard deviations. Okay, and I'm gonna get some number. Let me uh, just kind of write it down for you. You don't need to see me do this on the calculator, I don't think. And that's going to be 0.401. And then I'm gonna take 0.499 and I'm gonna add two standard deviations. And that's going to be 0.597. All right, so how do we interpret these two values? Well. We would interpret them as saying anything between 0.401 and 0.597 is a normal result. Like, oh, that's not a surprising result that we would get a, a probability, you know, or some kind of proportion of heads coming up that's between those two. Well, what was her proportion, right? So for Robin, right, Robin had 43 out of 100 which is 0.43, and that falls in between those two, right? So remember, we're looking for strong evidence that Robin's coin is unfair. So if Robin had gotten something that was below 0.401, let's say that it came up 30 times out of 100, that would be very unusual. Or let's say it came up 65 times out of 100, that would be, any, be very unusual. But anything between 40 times out of 100 and I guess 60 times out of 100, right, based on those two, that's not unusual. And so the answer is no, because her, whoops, her result falls within two standard deviations of the mean. Now, a classic mistake here is to construct only the one standard deviation interval, adding one standard deviation and subtracting one standard deviation, and you would actually find that her result would actually fall outside of that. Now, if you did that and then you said yes because it falls outside of that interval, you would pick up one out of two points because you knew you had to construct an interval and then you had to compare the value with that interval. But in this case, right, again, we only want to consider something unusual if it happens 5% or less of the time, right? I like the coin flip uh, thing. All right, cool. We're on to part three problems, so let me just take a moment to take another lemonade break. We're also coming upon the eight o'clock hour. My normal bedtime. Not my normal bedtime, I'm kidding. Oh man. Whew. Sorry about the slurp. Um, trying not to belch. Um, trying very hard. Or burp, you know. Mm. Ah. Anyway. Almost out of lemonade. Oh yeah, it's just, it's just ice now. It's just ice. I need, I need new lemonade. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, nothing like magical lemonade. It's not magical in that way. All right. Um, it makes you smart. Should all drink lemonade before you take the Regents exam tomorrow. Here we go. Here we go. Oh. Oh my God, oh, oh my God, it's Magical Lemonade. Uh, thank you, Magical Lemonade Man. Oh, I'm telling you, I think I drink like a thousand calories of lemonade while I do one of these. Um, uh, dump like, like the, whole, the whole Minute Maid you know, thing in there, it's all at once. Okay, so we're moving on to part three questions. I, I don't need my notes on this one. Um, all of these questions are worth four points, and 
as usual. Oftentimes they're broken into two parts where each part is roughly worth two points, although you never know. All right, so let's jump right into the first one and see how our first four point problem works out. Number 33, factor completely over the set of integers. This is an interesting piece of terminology, over the set of integers. That's actually a very complex idea because you can factor over the set of rational numbers, the integers, the irrational numbers, the complex numbers, etc. All right, but let's just factor this the way that we always know how, right? Three types of factoring, GCF, difference of perfect squares, trinomial. Now there's no GCF here because 16 and 81 share no common factors. This is clearly not a trinomial because it's not a trinomial doesn't have three terms. So it must be the difference of perfect squares, and in fact it is, because 16 is a perfect square, x to the fourth is a perfect square, and 81 is a perfect square. So I can begin by factoring 16x to the fourth minus 81 into 4x squared minus nine times 4x squared plus nine. Okay, great. Now, remember they say factor completely factor completely. Now I can't factor 4x squared plus 9, at least not over the set of integers. If they included the set of imaginary numbers I could, and that kind of gives away the next part of the problem, but I can't if I'm just talking about intervals. The sum of perfect squares doesn't work, but this is the difference of perfect squares again, right? So I can actually factor this into 2x plus 3 times 2x minus 3, and then this one again I leave alone. I need to leave it alone. In fact, if I try to factor that one in any way, shape, or form, I start to lose credit. So that's it, right? This is actually a problem that could have easily shown up on the Algebra 1 Regents exam. In fact, we saw one that was very similar to this one in the practice exam we did, and we had to stop at this point. I think it was like x to the fourth minus 16. So I had x squared minus four, x squared plus four, and then it was x minus two, x plus two. Then we had to leave the x squared plus four, so it was a little bit easier, but not much. All right, now let's take a look at the second part of this problem. Sarah graphed the polynomial y equals 16x to the fourth minus 81 and stated all the roots of y equals 16x to the fourth minus 81 are real. Is Sarah correct? Explain your reasoning. All right. Um, I wish that in math we didn't have a thousand different terms for the same thing, but we often do. The roots are another way of saying the zeros of an expression, okay? So the question is, are all the zeros of this expression real numbers? Well, let's set this expression equal to zero and let's solve using the zero product law. Let's also bring in a little red pen action. All right, now the zero product law is very specific. It says two x plus three is equal to zero. Uh, that would be x equals negative three halves. This one would say two x minus three is equal to zero. That would be x equals positive three halves. Now, you know, you might not like fractions. You may even think negative numbers aren't real. But these two are both real numbers, all right? The question is, what happens when I set 4x squared plus 9 equal to 0? Well, when I do that, right, and solve, I get 4x squared equals negative 9. I get x squared equals negative 9 fourths. I can now take the square root of both sides, and I get x equals plus or minus the square root of negative 9 fourths, which is plus or minus the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 9 fourths, that's going to be plus or minus i times 3 halves, or plus or minus 3 halves times i. Sorry. But there we go, right? So I have the root negative 3 halves, the root 3 halves, and the, th root, the two roots plus or minus 3 halves times i. So the answer is actually no, 2 of the roots are imaginary. Jeez, man, the red pen is like, it's like the revenge of the red pen night. It's actually pretty good in my other review sessions. 
only making certain guest appearances. All right, so there it is. By the way, there's a lot of great theory out there in terms of polynomials, one of which is the fact that the number of zeros, i.e. the number of roots, is the same as the power itself. All right, so an x to the fourth should have four roots. The problem is some of them can be real and some of them can be imaginary and some of them could repeat. All right, if I actually looked at the graph of this, I would only see these two roots because we only graph real numbers when we graph an equation like this. But because I only saw two real ones, it would imply that the other two were imaginary. Anyway, and they are. They're plus or minus three halves i. All right, problem number 34. The half-life of a radioactive substance is 15 years. Write an equation that can be used to determine the amount, S of t, of 200 grams of the substance that remain after t years. Okay, this is really cool. And this actually takes us back to a multiple choice question that we looked at, it feels like days ago, but it was probably only about an hour and a half ago, where we had a problem where there was a graph, an exponential graph that was doubling. Here, we're halving. Having, ha having, having, having. We're taking half of something. Anyway, whatever that verb is, we're having a radioactive substance every 15 years. So generally, the way that you write these equations is you take the original amount, 200, you multiply it by one half. Now you can't just raise it to the t, okay? Because if I leave it that way, then t is really the number of half-lives. It's not the number of years. Right? So what I end up doing, always, is it's always t divided by the half-life. Now I want you to think about this for a moment. Make sense of it. Don't just, just don't take my word for it, right? After 15 years, we should get to multiply 200 by one half once. So if I put 15 up here for t, I get 15 divided by 15, which is the number one, and I get to multiply 200 by one half to the first, bingo. Let's try another one. Let's say we had 30 years. I should get to multiply by one half twice. If I put 30 in here and I divide by 15, I get two. And then I have one half squared, meaning I get to multiply 200 by one half twice. Now, the only mistakes you could possibly make here is either leaving the 15 off or possibly, possibly doing something really crazy like this. Now that would be just nutsy. Okay, because then after one year, you would have gotten to multiply by one half 15 times, which wouldn't mean that the half-life was 15 years. It would actually mean the half-life was 1 15th of a year. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, you got to get that right. One half to the t divided by the half-life. One half raised to the t divided by the half-life. All right, so... We'll come back to that in a moment. Let's take a look at the second part of the problem. Determine algebraically, right, not graphically, but algebraically to the nearest year, how long it will take for one-tenth of this substance to remain. Okay, so let me write down my model again. S of t is equal to 200 times one-half to the t divided by 15. Now, I want to figure out, whoops, I want to figure out how long it's going to take until one-tenth of this sub substance remains. It'd be very tempting to set this equal to one-tenth. The problem is, I don't want it to be equal to one-tenth. I want it to be equal to one-tenth of the original amount. Now, the original amount was 200. One-tenth of that is 20. I hope everyone at the Algebra 2 level is comfortable with the idea that one-tenth of 200 is equal to 20, right? Don't make me take one-tenth of 200. That would not make me happy. Anyway, so this is the equation we're trying to solve. Now, as soon as you write that down, you start picking up like one point of credit. So let's start to solve it. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to divide by 200 on both sides. And it's probably advisable to just rewrite that as what it is, which is one-tenth. I think I'm going to even go decimals just because it allows me to write a little bit less, right? 20 divided by 200 is 0 0.1. Now I'm solving an exponential equation, and to do that algebraically, I have to bring a logarithm in. Which base should I use? Should I use base 10? Should I use base 2? Should I use the natural logarithm? The answer is it doesn't matter. The standard thing to do is use base 10, because then you don't actually have to write what the log is. 
So I'm gonna just take the log on both sides. That looks absolutely horrible. It looks like, like logo and stuff like that. Let me do a little bit of this. Okay, so I've got that, right? Now, why do I take the logarithm of both sides? Because I have a log law that says the logarithm of something raised to an exponent allows me to bring that exponent out. So t divided by 15 times the log of 1 half equals the log of 0 0.1. I'll figure out what all of these are eventually on my calculator. I'm gonna divide by the log of 1 half on both sides. At some point I could change that to the log of 0 0.5 if I decided to. Those cancel. And now, right, let me save myself a little bit of, little bit of work here as well. I'm gonna multiply both sides by 15, right? So t is gonna be equal to the log of 0.1 divided by the log of 0.5 times 15. That's calculator work. All right, let's do it. We've got the log base 10. Now I gotta put it in there. The log base 10 of 0 0.1 divided by the log base 10 of 0 0.5 or 1 half, whatever. All right, and then that's times 15. And that gives me 49.828. So I'll just remember that. 49.828. Let's see what they wanted me to round to to the nearest year. So that's 50 years. All right, there it is. I've been waiting to use logarithms. You know, all I got from logarithms so far was that one logarithm graph, and that was not very satisfying. I'm just gonna say so. Okay, problem 35. Ouch, ouch, sorry about that. Now I just hit the mic. Anyway, problem 35. Uh, Determine an equation for the parabola with focus at four comma negative one and directrix y equals negative five. Use of the grid below is optional, but highly, highly advised. Okay, all right. So this is one of those weird topics in algebra two, which is what's known as the conic definition or the locus definition of a parabola, okay? And there's these terms, the focus and the directrix, there's all sorts of stuff. Let's talk about that a little bit. We got a focus at uh, four comma negative one and a directrix, that, that also sounds sketchy, of negative five. So let's kind of, let's just, let's gra graph that on whatever this piece of graph paper is that they gave to me. I don't know, I'm gonna like put this here. Maybe this is my origin, um, this is my x-axis, et cetera. What, what in the world are these? Okay, so one, two, three, four, pardon me, there's my, uh, my focus. Um, okay, my directrix is y equals negative five. One, two, three, four, five. All right. All right, so my, let's talk about this a little bit, right? So the idea, of the focus directrix definition of a parabola is that a parabola is actually the collection of all points that are equidistant from a focus and a directrix. And there is all sorts of cool stuff involved in this, including physics of, um, of all, all sorts of cool things like satellite dishes are all in the shape of parabolas because they focus all of the incoming waves on the focal point, the focus point. There's all sorts of cool stuff. But, but in theory, right, the idea here is that there's some parabola where every point on the parabola, if you take any point on the parabola, like some point x comma y, and you measure the distance that it is away from this focus point, and you measure the distance it is away from that horizontal line, those two distances are the same. That they're, they're the same, okay? So one way of figuring out the equation of this parabola and the way that you really should go with, this is really the way you should go with, is by using this definition. So what would that definition say? Well, this distance is actually pretty easy. Right, that distance is simply this y coordinate minus this y coordinate, which is y minus negative five, which is actually just equal to y plus five. So the distance from any random point on this parabola to the directrix 
is simply given by the expression y plus 5. Now, the distance from this point to this point, however, that's given by the distance formula, okay? And specifically, if we're just trying to find the distance from the point x comma y to the point 4 comma negative 1, right, that distance would be equal to the square root of x minus 4 squared plus y plus 1 squared, okay? And that must be equal to y plus 5. Again, this is the distance from a, a random point x, y to the point 4 comma negative 1. That's the focus or focal point, right? And then this is the distance from that random point to the horizontal line y equals negative 5. Now, how do you turn that into an equation of a parabola, right? Well, you do that the same way each and every time. You square both sides. Now, squaring a square root is simply going to leave the square root, or it's going to simply remove the square root, all right? And we're going to be left with this. Now, to have the equation of the parabola, we have to get y all by itself and have all the x's and all that stuff on the other side. I'm going to actually leave this expression alone, x minus 4 quantity squared, but I'm going to square out this one, I'm going to square out that one, all right? Now, I'm going to do those in my head. Well, no. Oh, I finally did it. Oh, no. I think, I think it's, I think it's, no, I think it's, I think it's alone now. Okay, I think it's good. X minus 4 squared. Okay, I'm going to square this out in my head. That's y squared plus 2y plus 1. Square this one out in my head. Um, that's y squared plus 10y plus 25. All right, and what will always happen when you take this particular approach is, is a y squared on this side will cancel a y squared on that side. Always and every time. Every time it'll happen. Okay, now remember, I want to get all my y's on one side, all my other numbers on the other side. I've got a 10y over here and a 2y over here, so I'm just going to subtract a 2y from both sides. I don't want that 25 on this side, so I'm going to subtract a 25 from this side. Okay, what, what I'm going to be remaining on this side is an x minus 4 squared minus 24. And on this square side, I'm going to have an 8y. I'm almost there. And then I'm going to divide both sides by 8. Okay, now I have to divide everything by 8. All right, so ultimately, I know this is going to get a little messy, I'm going to have y equals 1 8 times x minus 4 squared minus 3. Look at that. My red pen icon. I mean, it's not even a red pen at this point, but the red pen icon is there. That's so fun. I wonder if that's like, no, my finger. Anyway, so this is the equation of my parabola, okay? Oh my goodness. Wow. Wow. And I, I really love this method. Uh, I'm a geek in this way. I, I love it. Okay. Uh, I did want to mention one other method um, real quick. Okay. This is way more of a plug and chug method. I don't particularly advise this, but it is a much faster way of doing it. Notice, right, in my little sketch here, the whole idea of the focus and the directrix is that the parabola lies sort of, if you will, kind of halfway in between the two. In other words, any point on the parabola is equidistant from that point and that horizontal line, including, including the vertex point. So I can literally always, always, always find the equation of my, or not the equation, the coordinates of the vertex of the parabola by just sketching something out. Remember, this is at 4, negative 1. Right? Let me like really make that clear given how bad my graph is. This is at 4, negative 1, right? So there's two units here, there's two units here, equidistant. That means that the vertex is at the point 4, comma, negative 3, right? Those are my vertex coordinates, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3. And by the way, do you see that vertex here? 4, negative 3. All right, so one thing that teachers will teach kids is if they can figure out the vertex, If they can figure out the vertex h comma k, then the equation of the parabola will always look, and let me look, put a little plus minus there, will always look like this. 1 over 4 times f, I'll explain what f is in a moment, 
times x minus h squared plus k, where h and k are just the, the vertex coordinates. Now, why is plus, plus and minus? Well, that's all, does the parabola point up or does it point down? If it points up, it's positive. If it points down, it's negative, and you can tell that by like where the line is compared to the point, okay? This one points upwards, and so it is positive. Now, what is f? f is what is literally called the focal length in physics, and it is the distance between the, the vertex of the parabola and the focus point, or the distance between the vertex of the parabola and the directrix. Either way here, the focal length is equal to two. So our equation we could just get by doing one over four times two times x minus three, whoops, sorry, no, x minus four squared minus three, and that would then be 1 8 times x minus 4 squared minus 3. So that is certainly the much, much, much faster way of doing this problem, but it also requires the memorization of a random formula out of nowhere, right, for no reason other than just kind of getting this problem right. But it's completely acceptable to use, even though it makes the problem like that. Oh, let's do some probability. Problem number 36. Juan and Philippe practice at the driving range before playing golf. The number of wins and corresponding practice times for each player are shown in the table below. So, you know, for the short practice time, right, Juan wins eight of them and Philippe wins 10 of them. For long practice time, Juan wins 15 of them, Philippe wins 10 of them. I don't exactly know what that means, but okay, right? So let's take a look at the first one. Given that the practice time was long, determine the exact probability that Philippe wins the next match. I wish they wouldn't say Philippe wins the next match. I just wish they would say that Philippe wins a match, right? Given that the practice time is long. Now, as soon as we get this phrase, given that the practice time was long, this is what's called conditional probability. And we want to figure out the probability that Philippe wins the way that we we could symbolize that as the probability of Philippe winning with a vertical bar given the practice time was long. We're just gonna eliminate these. We aren't gonna even think about them. If, if I tell you that the practice time was long, then there's no reason to even look at the short time. Right, it's sort of like if I said, you know, what is the probability that an American voted in, la in the last presidential election? You wouldn't consider somebody who lives in China, right? They're not part of that set. So as soon as I talk about the practice time being long, the short practice times are irrelevant. Now, how many long practice times are there? Well, there are 27 total. How many does Philippe, uh, yep, how many does Philippe win? Philippe wins 12 of them. And so the answer is 12 27ths. Now, you could certainly take 12 27ths and I'm sorry, I just want to get up to my notes. You could certainly take 12 27ths and reduce it. You could write it as a decimal, right? But you want to leave it as an exact answer one way or another, and they don't say reduce it, so I'm going to leave it as 12 27ths. Man, that's an easy two points right there. Okay, now let's take a look at the second part of the problem. Determine whether or not the two events, Philippe wins and long practice time, are independent. Justify your answer. Okay. So this is really cool and there's two ways to do it and I'm gonna actually show you the two ways. One way I think is very intuitive and the other way is just sort of a formula plug and chuck. The intuitive way is basically saying, look, if the probability that Philippe wins has nothing to do with long practice time, then they're independent of each other, right? All right, if on the other hand they're different, Right, the probability that Philippe wins and long practice time, the probability Philippe wins if there's long practice time are different, then they're not independent. Now, we already know what the probability is that Philippe will win if they've had a long practice time. I love the fact that just went blurry. There we go. Uh, so now, I just want to figure out what the pro so first, let's, let's get this down again. The probability that Philippe wins given a long practice time that was 12, 20, whoops, 12, 27 Now let's just figure out the probability that Philippe wins. Well, what is the probability that Philippe wins? Now we want to look at everything. 
Well, if I add up all of these numbers, I get like 18 plus 27, that's gonna be 45 total. Uh, how many times does Philippe win? Philippe wins 22 times. So the probability that Philippe is gonna win is 22 out of 45. Okay, right now, if these two fractions are actually equal to each other, then the two things are independent because the fact that there's a long practice time doesn't affect the probability that Philippe wins. That's the straightforward way. Now, as we all know, two fractions can be equal to each other but look completely different, right? So this might be where I wanna do something like say, well, let me look at what 12 27 is as a decimal, that's 0.44 repeated. You know, so I could just do this or 0.4 repeated. Uh, let's do 22 out of 45. We could also just write both of them in like simplest terms to see if they're the same. Of course, that's 0.48 repeated. And since these are different, then they are not independent. All right, and I really, I really think that's the way you should go, right? So I already know the probability that Philippe is gonna win given that there's a long practice time. I compare that to the probability that Philippe's gonna win. If those two had come out the same, they would be independent, but they're not. Now, the other way of doing it is to do what's called the product test. And that's basically saying, is the probability that F and L happens equal to the probability that F happens times the probability, oops, the probability that L happens, right? If this is true, if this is true, they're independent. And if this is not true, they're not independent, all right? And this is also pretty easy to do. The probability F and L, right? The probability F and L, right, would be 12 out of 45. All right, so that would be 12 out of 45, or 12 45ths, sorry. The probability of F, all by itself, we calculated right here, so I'm gonna take advantage of that, is 22 45ths, times the probability of just L, we never looked at that, the probability of just L would be 27 45ths. Now again, the real question is, you know, is that equal to that? Well, again, you can just work it out on your calculator and you'll find that it's not, okay? And again, we could work it out, but these two don't end up being equal, so they are not independent. And again, you may wanna like work out the decimal version of both sides of that just to feel comfortable with it, but let's keep moving. Hey, keep moving because we're moving on to the last problem. All right, let me take a moment. Right? We have got our one and only one six point problem. And appropriately, especially given my t shirt, it is a trigonometric modeling problem. I love a good pun, I love, love a good dad joke and a good math joke. If we can put them all together, even better. All right, let's take a look at number 37. Griffin is riding his bike down the street in Churchville, New York at a constant speed when a nail gets caught in one of his tires. Oh boy, that's tough luck for Griffin. I would just fall right over. The height of the nail above the ground in inches can be represented by the trigonometric function f of t equals negative 13 times the cosine of 0 0.8 pi t plus 13 where t represents the time in seconds that the nail first became caught in the tire. Determine the period of f of t. All right, well the first part of this problem is a very technical thing, right? The period is sort of the horizontal distance that it will take before a sine or cosine graph repeats its entire pattern, all right? Now, whenever we have an equation that kind of looks like this, All right, this number right in here is what's called the frequency. Sometimes it's referred as by physicists to the angular frequency. All right, in this particular case, that is 0 0.8 
times pi. Now that is not the period. But the frequency and the period, which is oftentimes represented by either the letter P, understandably, or the capital letter T, not lowercase t, um, those, that quantity and the B share a very special relationship, which is that B times P is always, always, always equal to 2 pi. Always equal to 2 pi. All right. So in other words, 0.8 times pi times the period is equal to 2 pi. I can now divide both sides by 0 0.8 times pi. All right, that cancels. The pi's cancel, and my period is simply 2 divided by 0 0.8. Let's see what that is on our calculator. And that's 2.5. So the period is 2.5. All right, now let's take a look at the second part of the problem. Interpret what the period represents in this context. All right, here's the key, right? The period always refers to, that didn't help much, it always refers to the distance that the input variable, and I say distance loosely, the interval that the input variable has to go through before the whole thing or the whole pattern repeats itself. So what is the input variable? What is t? t represents the time in seconds since the nail first became caught in the tire. So 2.5 represents an interval of t. t is time in seconds. So 2.5 seconds. So what does that really mean? It takes 2.5 seconds for the tire to make a complete rotation, right? It takes 2.5 seconds for the tire to make a complete rotation. That's it. And the period always has some kind of meaning like that. You look at the input variable, what are its units, right? The period then represents that many units for it takes for the whole pattern to start repeating itself, right? For the whole pattern to start, I can't, I, there's no way I can do that by looking at that and then, anyway. All right, there's still another part of this problem and it's the last part of this exam. On the grid below, graph at least one cycle of f of t that includes the y-intercept of the function. All right, well, let me write down what that function is again. All right, I've got my notes here. I don't need to go back there. All right, my function is f of t equals negative 13 times the cosine of 0 0.8 pi t plus 13. Now, you spent a lot of time doing trig graphing in this course. It was one of the major focal points of the trig units. You produced tons of graphs that kind of looked something like this, right? Now, this is a cosine graph. Its midline is 13. Its amplitude is 13. We already know its period is two and a half seconds, okay? Let's take a look at this on the graphing calculator. Why not, right? Oh, before I do that, though, Let's think about a couple things in terms of the window. Again, we know that the period is 2.5. We know it's gonna repeat itself every 2.5 seconds, all right? We also should be able to figure out the max and the min. Remember, the, the y min is gonna be that midline minus the amplitude, which is zero. Our y max is going to be the midline plus the amplitude, which is 26. Now this kind of makes sense. Remember, this whole thing is the height of the nail above the ground, right? So it has a minimum height above the ground of zero inches and a maximum height above the ground of 26 inches. That, that, that sounds good. Okay, anyway, let's, let's take a look at what this thing looks like on the graph. And I'm gonna, again, I'm just gonna open up a brand new document so that we can do a brand new graph. New document, no. Let's add a graph, let's do it. Okay, so what do we have as our function again? It's negative 13 times 
the cosine of 0 0.8 times pi, can't leave off that pi, times x, also can't leave off the x, that would be a disaster. All right, I'm in radian mode, which I absolutely have to be, and I hit enter. Okay, and I got something that looks crazy, and of course I have something that looks crazy, because my window isn't even remotely correct. Remember, I'm gonna repeat every two and a half units along this x-axis. So let me make my window a little bit better. Let's go into my window, and let's actually go into window settings this time. Let's have our minimum be x equals zero. Now remember, it's every two and a half seconds. So uh, yeah, I'll go out to 10. Now remember, our minimum y value was zero. I might want a little bit of negative y value, but not much, I'll go negative five. Our maximum y value is 26, but I can say 30, just so I kind of get everything in. And look at this. Now remember, this was zero to 10, right? And our period is two and a half, and we get, not surprising, one cycle, two cycles, three cycles, four cycles, right? Now, they say I just have to have one cycle. They don't say I have to have two or three or anything. So in fact, I really just kind of want, I really just, I just want this. Let's go back to our window, our window box. I kind of, I, oh no, I don't want that. Okay, <laughs> anything but that. I really just want this, right? I want that one cycle. That's all I want, right? And of course, they could have just said sketch this, right? And it would have been great, and I would have sketched it, and it would have been beautiful. But instead, they have to give me this silly piece of graph paper that I have to do, on, do it on. All right, so this, this is just insane. Now remember, in the y-axis, I have to get 26 units in. I gotta go from zero to 26. How many squares are there? Of course, there's 20. So I'm not fitting 26 in there unless I go by twos. Thank you so much. Let's go by twos. Uh, and let's make this the x-axis since I don't have to go below the x-axis. I might as well make that the x. So two, four, six, eight, 10. Two, four, six, eight, 20. Uh, two, four, six, eight, 30. I don't need to go that high. My maximum was only 26. Now to make matters even worse, right? My period is only two and a half seconds. Now I could totally go by tenths or something. Actually I can't because there's only 20 this way as well. So I can't go by tenths because then I'd only get two seconds in. Look, here's the thing. I will always tell people this. Trig graphs come in quarters. They come in quarters. Let's see if I can do this, right? Midline, maximum, I can't, I can't. Maximum, midline, minimum, yep, nope, anyway. And midline again, I, that didn't work at all. Anyway, the point is it comes in quarters. So what I wanna do is pick a number that is conveniently divided by four. Let's go with 12, right? So I'm gonna say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. You might say, why didn't I go with eight? Well, that probably would have been good too. But I'm just gonna say 2.5 right there. What are each one of these worth? I don't care. I don't care, I really don't care. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find my midline. Now remember, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. My midline is 13. And I have to go by twos on my x-axis. So of course, I've gotta have y equals 13 right there. Now I'm just about there, okay? I know my cosine graph is starting at a minimum here. So I'm gonna start right here. Now after a quarter of these, I will be up to my midline. Now remember, this was 12. So 12 divided by four is three. So one, two, three, here I'll be at my midline. Right, now after another three, one, two, three, I'll be at my maximum. My maximum, remember, was 26. So here I'll be at my maximum, three more, and I'll be back down to my midline, and then finally at 2.5, I will be back to my minimum. And that's one full cycle. Now look, I, I looked at various solution sets. Some of them went out 10 units for two and a half, right, which then would mean the halfway point would be five, and then the half of that would be two and a half, confusingly enough. It doesn't really matter. Just make sure you've got your period on here, 
right? And that you've got, you've got your maximum in the right place, your two minimums in the right place, and your midlines in the right place. That's it. Now, last part of this test, does the height of the nail ever reach 30 inches above the ground? Justify your answer. Uh, no, the graph never hits 30. Or, I even like this, uh, oh, come on, really, really, we're, we're done, we're done, right? What, it's like the last thing we're gonna do, and it, okay, here we go. Okay, no, <laughs> because the maximum height is 26 inches. And I think that's the easiest way to answer that. No, because the maximum height is 26 inches. You could also just say no, because the graph never hits y equals 30, or it never intersects the horizontal line y equals 30. There's lots of sophisticated ways of saying it, but I think the easiest way is, hey, the max height is 26 inches, so it never gets 30 inches above the ground. All right, and that is the June 2019 Algebra 2 Regents exam. Now the Algebra 2 Regents exam is going to be tomorrow morning, right? Uh, you'll be probably starting it sometime between 7.30 and 8.30 in the morning. You've got three hours for the exam and if you've got extended time, you've even got more than that, right? You've got plenty of time to work on this exam. Now, obviously this is likely to be the hardest math test that you've taken up to this point in your academic career. And that is the way it is. They do put a decently nice curve on the exam, so that's good. Don't forget that you've got your calculator and it can do all sorts of wonderful things, including some stuff that we never even got a chance to look at on here. Like for instance, it can operate with things like complex and imaginary numbers. We just never had a context in which to do that, particularly in this, in this test. So there's a lot of things it can do, a lot of ways that you can check answers by using your graphing calculator. And don't forget, you've got the three hours, so take your time enjoy it, right? This is maybe the last test you'll take. In all likelihood, many of you are probably taking this and then you're gonna take physics, you know, the next day. But hey, that is what it is. Maybe some of you have already taken your chemistry and this will be the last one that you have to take. I hope that's the case. Either way, I just wanna wish you good luck tomorrow. All right, get a good night's sleep, eat a good breakfast so you're not sitting there at 9.30 in the morning with your stomach rumbling, okay? And you're going to do great and then you're gonna have an awesome summer where you don't have to think about math at all. All right, well thank you for joining me. This has been the Algebra 2 Regents Review hosted by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler and until I see you again, keep thinking and keep solving problems.